the first letter of John, the word of life. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we've heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testified to it and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you that we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us all from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. This is the word of the Lord. Be to God. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we listen to your word, stir our hearts, speak peace to our minds, and inspire us to live out your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we are, nearly three weeks into this new year. How's it going for you so far? Good? Okay. Do you know tomorrow it's so-called Blue Monday? That's the day when I think the credit card bill from Christmas hits most people's doorstops. Uh, or whatever they're called, uh, not doorstops, that's, that's not a British expression, is it? You know what I mean, the, the mat, the doormat, that's the word. Anyway, in this season, which can be hard for some people, it's great, isn't it, that we can gather here, we can listen to God's word together, and we can encourage one another on our journey of faith. So I'm going to encourage you to find a Bible this morning because you're right, we're starting a new sermon series. So it's always good, particularly when we're focusing on a book to have it in front of us so we can refer to it and look at it. Thank you, Linda. Fantastic. When I was at school, we used to do, what was it? Draw your swords. That was in Scotland. What was it? That was Scripture Union used to do that. And it was who can find the page fastest. So who can find the page number in the Pew Bible fastest for me? Sorry? 116. Thank you very much. So that's in the... 236. Oh, dear. So 236 in the towards the back the new testament it's towards the end of the new testament so right at the back of the bibles okay we're all there fantastic good i said we come to encourage one another and this book of one john i think is fundamentally about john the writer more about him later writing to encourage a community or communities of faith. Now, you might be wondering why. Why, Rachel? Why have you chosen one John for this season? Well, do you know, I really enjoyed Kate's idea of what song sums up your life. Heather, you are the one and only. That was an absolute classic. I know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> And I think I've taken some inspiration from the Beatles this morning. 
I wonder if you could guess which song of the Beatles I might be thinking about. Oh, let's see, this is a test. Pardon, help! <laughs> Jackie! <laughs> now it's, all you need is love. Do, 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 do. Anyway, because aside from 1 Corinthians, I think that this book of 1 John is one of those that I most associate with love. Uh, do you know there's a passage that's read at the beginning of a wedding? Uh, God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. That's 1 John 4. Uh, we'll be coming to that, of course, later. And this focus on love, uh, and by the way, one thing you will notice in this book is John loves to return to a theme. Now, he does it again and again and again. That could sound quite negative, but the way I like to think about it, it's almost like when you go up a spiral staircase and you go kind of slightly round and round, but as you go up, you get a different view, don't you, of the same scene. And I think that's what we will see as we go through this book together, that as we return to these same recurring things, we've had God is light this morning, that comes back again, uh, that God is love, we come back to them, we discover more and more about what those things are. And love is a central theme. St. Jerome speaks of the elderly John when later on in his life, uh, when he was uh, an older man, he was amongst the followers in Ephesus, and he was carried in, barely able to speak, and yet saying to the, uh, to the crowd gathered, you must love one another. That was all he could pretty much manage. And when they asked why, he responded, well, only if you have done this, is it enough? Only if you have loved, is it enough? And so for John, clearly, love was at the very focus. So again, why one, John? Why that focus on love? Well, I think as a church at the moment, I think we really need to explore what that looks like. Tomorrow evening, our church council, our PCC, are meeting, and we will be making a, a final decision on this pattern of worship for this season going forward. Now, I don't know what the outcome of that will be, but I'm sure because of human nature and who we are, it won't be everybody's first choice. If that turns out to be true, how are we as a church going to continue moving forward positively together as a family of faith, united, and I pray also to grow into the future? Well, we're going to need to embrace that love. Love has got to be at the very heart of who we are. But love is a complex thing, isn't it? It looks very different in different times, in different places. If you asked our dog, Rosie, that's an odd thing to say, isn't it? How can you ask a dog? Anyway, <laughs> what love looked like? Well, love looked like, to quote the film Rose, uh, Frozen, Love is an open door. She loves to go and jump on our bed. Now, I'm not very loving when her paws are filthy. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but love is complex. It looks different to different people. And we have to keep an open mind about what love looks like. And we'll be coming back to that. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So today, I want to begin this sermon series by looking at the book as a whole before we look at chapter one specifically. So what is one John then? Well, together with volumes two and three, which we won't be covering, they comprise a series of letters. Now, maybe it's, it's pretty different from those letters that we often attribute to Paul, but nevertheless written to very real churches in very real contexts. Admittedly, quite a long time ago, but human nature doesn't change that much, does it? So I think that some of the issues they were facing were certainly ones that we will be facing here in 21st century Hoddesdon. And the context? Well, it is a letter, but it's an unusual one. You'll notice there's no addressee up front. It doesn't start with dear such and such, or indeed the typical greetings that you would get in the letters. 
Now, when I read it, it almost feels a little bit more like a written sermon. Maybe that's a clue uh, that rather like Ephesians, which we covered a few weeks back, people believe that it was originally written as almost a, a round robin to various churches. And the traditional view is it was written right towards the end of the first century by the Apostle John, who also wrote the, first, uh, the fourth gospel. I don't know if you notice, as, as Marian read this morning, that prologue, those opening four verses, sound tremendously, there are familiarities, aren't there, with the, in the beginning. You know, there was that right at the start there. If you look, we declare to you what was from the beginning. And as we go through, you'll see themes recurring. Light, that's there in John 1 as well. Not to be confused with 1 John 1, but John 1. A focus on life, eternal life, the new commandment. Some of these ideas are very much in an overlap uh, with that fourth gospel, which is why, you know, we believe that it was the same author. But it's also got the tone of authority of one of the apostles, someone who was close, who saw what was happening. And as we read through it, we begin to see what the focus is. And I think it's clear that those who have received it have been confronted with some sort of false teaching that set them off on the wrong path. And that's what I want to focus on this morning, because it seems that John is seeking, well, partly to correct them, but as I said earlier, this is a pastor who has a great concern for them, who loves them, but doesn't want to, them to see, to stay where they are, but to keep moving on. And what was that set of false ideas that was circulating? Well, it was that Jesus didn't have a real human existence in a human physical body. That came from the idea, which, in case you're interested, is part of Gnosticism, that uh, physical matter, so the stuff of our bodies, the stuff of the physical creation, was inherently evil and bad. And therefore, a good God couldn't possibly inhabit a real body, a real physical body, and therefore Jesus must have been a spiritual being. Now, as John speaks into this, we see here in chapter one, him emphasizing the reality of the incarnation. So if you look there, we'll see that in verses one to four, which incidentally are a one sentence in Greek. Whew, that would have been a challenge, wouldn't it, Marian? The one sentence and the Greek, I'm sure as well, but never mind. <laughs> but there, you'll see it. How he stresses the senses we have heard, we have seen, we have touched. He wants to emphasize that Jesus was a real human being, a genuine historical figure, a physical person. Okay, so that might be interesting. <laughs> But you may be sitting there now thinking, well, so what? Why is that important? Well, I think for me, it underlines the fact that our faith is never meant to be an escape into a purely spiritual realm, but is very much involved with the physical. And another thing that we'll see as we move through this letter of John is that John is always emphasizing the importance of faith, which is practical, which is lived out. Again, you'll see it there in verse six. You know, if we say one thing, but do another, then we do not do what is true. Our faith must be matched by what we do. I don't know if you caught the Archbishop of Canterbury's Christmas sermon. Did anyone listen to that? Oh, it's great. Incidentally, if you Google it, you can read it, and I think it's a fantastic read. Um, but in the context, he said, of everything that was circulating in the run-up to Christmas, you know, we were talking about how do we save Christmas? How can we make sure that we can still gather with our families and still really enjoy Christmas? In response to that, he said, 
It's not we who save Christmas, but Christmas who saves us. Yes, we did do a lot of wonderful things to try and save our Christmas. The vaccine was one of them. But as the Archbishop notes, we can't vaccinate our mortality away. We may try to live outside the limits of having real and being real human bodies. We may deny our mortality. We may try and control what we can't control. But time and time again, we butt up against the fact that we are real people. And sadly, I think, in the last couple of years particularly, we've seen that there are things we can't conquer. As humanity, we're not on this constantly upward trajectory towards some sort of perfection. We've seen that in the news this week, haven't we? Where we see, sadly, selfishness, lack of love, those base human instincts which at times take over. And as the Archbishop continues, we cannot save ourselves. But the good news is, God can. And the gift of salvation came in the form of a tiny infant in a manger who cried when he was hungry, who smiled, who pooed, who did everything that a real human does. The amazing good news of Christmas, and we're still in Christmas season, <laughs> is that the God who is without limits chose to empty himself and come in the limits of a child. He entered into our fragile, our risky, our uncertain, our unknown and dangerous lives in Jesus. And in that, God experiences with us that deepest set of fears that we have, our sense of injustice, hardships, those things we can't control, our lives. God came to us in the limits of our humanity so we can know we are not alone. And so the God we worship understands the challenges we face, the reality of our lives, the messiness of our lives. That is not some abstract spiritual realm that we can escape to. But God meets us here in our human messiness and walks alongside us. And I believe that includes our common life as a church too. I don't think when we come to church, we're promised something that's all sweetness and light. <laughs> Somehow that we'll all get on and never have a crossword, never disagree. We're not like that, are we? But we have to expect that in our individual messiness, when we come together, there will be messiness too. The challenge becomes then, how will we get on? How do we disagree well? How do we keep going even when we're really fed up with someone else and still remain united? And once again, in these opening verses of 1 John, he's emphasizing that. Do you see it there in verse 7 when he's saying that his longing is, is that they may have fellowship with one another? And I think he hopes and prays for that for us too. Christian fellowship is very precious, but it's not easy. In community settings, it's particularly difficult. It requires work, give and take, grace, forgiveness. We all know that. And as a church in the weeks ahead, that's going to be expected from us once again as we settle into this new way of being. It may not be entirely of our choosing, but as we walk in the light, walking close to God, I believe God will help us to set aside maybe some of our own preferences for the greater good. Is that easy? No. <laughs> Again, John acknowledges this there. Verse 8, it calls us to be open and honest about some of those feelings we may have. We might feel angry. We might feel frustrated. 
Indeed, and I think another focus of that opening chapter is that we need to be honest about who we are, that each of us messes up. We may try and deceive ourselves, but the truth is out. As a child, my grandparents loved to show slides. That was one of the things. They would go away and they would come back and have a slideshow. Did anyone else do that sort of thing? Right. I've inherited all of those slides along with all of my parents as well. What do you do with them? Who knows? Anyway, we thought we'd have a, a slideshow. We set up the projector, which I also inherited, in the living room, and we shone the light on the wall. My word, there are a lot of imperfections in that wall. <laughs> You don't notice them normally, but you shine a really bright projector light on a wall and you'll think, oh, OK, that needs a bit of work. And I think a similar thing is true. As we come before God's holiness, God's light, the light that came into being and creation that sustains everything we are, it shows up who we are. Now, that could sound very bad news, but I don't think it is. Because self-deception can be exhausting, can't it? It's hard work. It eats away at the inside of us. And yet again, the amazing promise that John gives us here, there, verse 9, is that once again, when we acknowledge that, when we acknowledge it both to ourselves and to God, that slate is wiped clean. We are set free. The guilt we trap ourselves in, both they make me sometimes real and sometimes imagined, is gone. So, as we've started or beginning this uh, sermon series on 1 John, chapter 1, what do we see? Well, we see a pastor writing to a group of churches, encouraging them to hold on to the fundamental aspects of faith. Things which have been there, there, verse 1, since the very beginning, that Jesus truly did walk this earth, experience the messiness of our human lives, so that we may have confidence that whatever we may find ourselves walking through, life, its messiness, either as individuals or as a church together, God is there, walking with us, encouraging us forwards. And furthermore, when we bring that messiness of our lives, the guilt that traps us, those longings which are unfulfilled, the blue Mondays, the grief we bear, God promises to transform them, forgive them, set us free. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's wonderful good news to start any new year. Amen.